It happened in 1991, the first spark. Um, I had gone to see the movie Awakenings with my husband. And my husband and I were kind of newly married. It was just a few years that we were married. So he didn't know my grandmother at all. She had passed many years before that. So we're at the movie theater watching Awakenings. And there was a character in the movie named Lucy, played by Alice Drummond, phenomenal actress, that caught a ball in her wheelchair. And she I guess she had like locked in syndrome. I forget what they called it in the movie. This was like 1991, but Robert De Niro and um, Robin Williams were in the movie. It's very, very good movie. So she, she caught this ball and had a gaze about her. And this gaze brought back memories of when I was on my grandmother, uh, visiting my grandmother who was institutionalized with Alzheimer's. She had early Alzheimer's and on her deathbed the day before she passed, my parents and I went to see her and she did not recognize them. She was basically mute and more vegetative at the time. It was very, very end stage, but she reached out to me and mumbled and made a sound and connected with me. I'm 14 years old when this happened at her bedside. That movie brought that time back. So this is 1991. And it was 1971 when my grandmother passed and I was at her bedside. So 20 years after she passed, I'm crying in the movie theater. Welcome to the All's Authors Podcast. We're so glad you found us. I'm Mary Ann Shuko, a registered nurse, author, and dementia daughter. Please join me for bi-weekly episodes with our authors as we talk about their dementia journeys, sharing intimate details and painfully obtained knowledge to help others currently on that path. We hope these stories offer you comfort and support as we strive to break the silence and stigma surrounding a dementia diagnosis. May one of our authors speak to your experience. I'm Laura Davis, author of The Burning Light of Two Stars, my award-winning memoir about caring for a mother with dementia, a mother who happened to betray me in the past. I have been teaching writing as a pathway for healing for 25 years, and I'm proud to be partnering with All's Authors and Kensington Senior Living to present a free writing workshop for caregivers on Saturday, March 18th from 9.30 to 11.30 Pacific time. The workshop will be online so you could log in from anywhere and from any time zone. I wanna stress that to participate, you don't need to consider yourself a writer. You can benefit or attend if you're a complete beginner. All you need is a notebook and a pen. It has been well established that writing and honest sharing are deeply healing practices that relieve anxiety, increase resilience, and promote self-compassion. Sharing caregiving stories with those facing similar challenges diminishes isolation by providing a life-giving community of support. In this workshop, you will learn to use words and story to explore the joys, complexities, and challenges of being a caregiver to a loved one with memory loss. I hope to see you there. The workshop is free, but you need to register to attend. The link to sign up is in the show notes. I hope you'll click on it now, and I hope to see you on Saturday, March 18th. This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. 
Always consult with your physician for any medical advice. And always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to The Whole Care Network. Poetry, whether reading or writing it, can be a powerful tool to ease our dementia caregiving journey, allowing us to express our deepest emotions, unravel our confusion and angst, and learn from and understand others. Susan J. Faris, MSN RN, is the author of Poetic Expressions in Nursing, Sharing the Caring, poems written when she became a nurse poet in the 1990s. Heartbreaking memories of losing her grandmother, Anne, to early onset Alzheimer's when she was a young teen inspired her first poem, Anne's Zest Ends. In this episode, we discuss how witnessing her grandmother's decline as a child profoundly impacted her even 50 years later, why a chance scene in a movie inspired her to start writing poetry, and the value of poetry as expression for nurses and caregivers. April is National Poetry Month. Please join us on April 18th at 2 p.m. when we present Poetry for the Dementia Journey, an All's Authors Live virtual Q&A featuring several of our poets. Subscribe to our website at allsauthors.com to receive notice of these events. Let's get started. Hi, Sue. Welcome to the All's Authors Podcast. How are you today? I'm doing great, Marianne. Early here in San Diego. <laughs> so. Yes, you did. You sacrificed and got up early for me. So thank you. We up. appreciate that. Um, we, I've been wanting to have you on the podcast for a number of reasons. First of all, you're a fellow nurse, mm -hmm. and I love speaking with my nurses. And we have recently in the podcast have interviewed a number of nurses. So that's um, really exciting for me because we share a lot in common professionally, as well yes. as authors and as caregivers. So um, I want to make sure we talk about your nursing career and how it has impacted you know your you with your little short dementia journey that you had as a child and had a lasting impact on you. So I want to make sure we touch on all how all of that has um, affected you throughout your life. It's had uh, had an impact. And also, um, you served in our military. Thank you very much. So we we want to hear all about your nursing experience and kind of like wrap it up with like where you are now because you've completely changed directions in, in a long life, which is wonderful. That's what we uh, all aspire to do. So please share with us. Um, let's, let's go back to that little girl whose grandma, Anne, had dementia. And this was way back in the 1970s and had a tre tremendous impact on you. Tell us about that. What was that? What was going on for that little girl? Oh, wow. <laughs> Profound, actually. So I grew up in New Jersey um, and this was actually during the 60s from about 64 and she passed in 71 at age 60. Anne was my maternal grandmother and she was my soulmate. I mean, absolutely bonded, um, spent lots of time with her and my grandfather. Um, she was full of zest and energy and smiles. And then all of a sudden, she gradually deteriorated. Well, this is in the 60s. Nobody really knew what Alzheimer's was. And I know my mom had to take her to several doctors, several different doctors, to finally get diagnosed. And... Um, Ultimately, she was institutionalized for several years um, because she became kind of a threat to us and to herself, you know, with, with safety. That was devastating. I used to visit her several times with my mom and some of the aunts, um, my, my grandmother's sisters, that were really supportive during this. Um, she came from a family of, I think, nine children, and I think her mom had something going on as well before she passed. So it was familial as well. Several of her brothers and sisters developed Alzheimer's, but she developed it early. She had early onset and died at age 60, institutionalized. So she was just very, um, very, very connected to me. Um, her, her, her pace in life, her verve, that kind of thing. And was my soulmate. 
Mm-hmm. And um, she's still in my heart after all these years. She died in 71. And uh, I guess, yeah, it was 50 years ago, a couple of years ago. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Um, yeah, it's just amazing how, how long ago it was and how she's still present. Yeah. And I think it um, the experience shows how deeply we are inf- affected by a dementia experience, even when we're children and all of the feelings that it come that come up with it and the emotions and the uh, not understanding and the questions. And oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Because I was I mean, when she it was gradually changing. I became afraid of my grandmother, mm. who I absolutely love. So I was very conflicted and, un, you know, it was confusing. Mm-hmm. It was confusing. And very, very sad. And we kind of bottled, after she passed, we we bottled it up for a long, long time. It was a stigma. And uh, so the poetry, as we'll get to in this, it freed me up to be able to look at it from a nursing standpoint 20 years after her death in a poem like miraculously and very serendipitously. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's part of my story with the poetry. We can talk about a little bit whenever you want. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I never expected a poem to release 20 years of grief, basically, and heal. Yeah. And you mentioned stigma. And back in those days, I don't think we even had the word Alzheimer's. People were considered to have like hardening of the arteries or senile senility, right. uh, senile dementia, things like that. Mm-hmm. It was in many cases considered to be a normal event in aging that right. this happen. It wasn't as seen as an abnormal event for the aged, even though she was right. very young. She was young. She was in her 50s dealing with this. Yeah. Yeah. Like she was in the facility, so there were probably others there that maybe weren't so young back then in those days. I don't even know what the mm. quality of, what the quality of care was like. Do you have any comments about that? Do you remember any of it? I remember that she looked disheveled when we would pick her up for day passes, and it was embarrassing because we would have cared for her much better. Um, I don't know what the situation is nursing wise or census wise or acuity wise or anything with psychiatric nursing at the time I was a kid. I was between right. eight and 14 years old going through this. Mm. So, so I was 14 when she passed. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was profound. Um, and this is also in the poem. Um, when we went to her bedside the day before she passed, they called us to come and see her and my parents, she didn't connect with my parents at all. But with me, she reached for me with her arm. See where my arm is here. And like mumbled and stared right through me. She knew me at the very end, Mm -hmm. which was just, which just impacted my life forever Mm. because she connected, you know, and she was basically mute and vegetative at the time and had tuberculosis too. So, and that's why my mom wasn't even allowed to see her because she had two young children at the time. So she was limited into how often she could see her yeah. at the hospital too. Hard. But, but the fact that she connected with me just, ha- it haunts me in a good way and, and just an unbelievable way mm-hmm. for my heart to know that she recognized me at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Children in dementia and in their personal experiences are um, one of the pillars of our organization, we do have a lot of resources. And many times people don't think that Alzheimer's dementia is a child's concern, but it certainly is because they are impacted when someone they love, whether it's a grandparent or a parent or any relative really has has the condition. It's going to have an impact on their life. So um, I'm interested to hear about your experiences, you know, having experienced it as a child so many years ago and how it still to this day is something that you want to continue to think about. Absolutely. And Mm. gosh, if we only had books by Al's authors for kids back then, something would have helped. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And even if my mom couldn't explain it to me, a book would would have at least been, you know, heartwarming. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll get through this. Mm-hmm. We know, you know, something like, I know you love your grandma, you know, or just just feeling some comfort, I guess, 
knowing that she's okay, but she may not be able to express herself or take care of herself or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's pretty profound, actually. It's very, very complex. And I know I grew up and matured early in a certain way because of the experience. And I probably was called to nursing because of the experience. Um, And, you know, and now as a communicator, I do PR and communications. Being part of Al's authors has brought it full circle so that I can help other people, especially those with young children dealing with this, because it's the same feelings 50 some odd years ago and now Mm -hmm. when grant when this happens to grandma or grandpa or you know mom there's still a ton of questions is kind of giving concerns and and everything Mm -hmm. um impact on the family is still tremendous so tell us about your nursing career so um what made you decide to do that i remember going to my guidance counselor in high school and you know figuring out what i wanted to do for college and we we decided that I liked people and I liked science. Uh, and so nursing was just a good fit. Mm-hmm. And I also, while I was a student in nursing school, I worked, because uh, one of your questions was, did you have any experience uh, with home care, assisted living or long-term care? I was a, a nursing student. And one summer, my dad knew someone that um, either was the administrator or at a nursing facility, like a long-term care. So I had a summer job as a nurse's aide, basically, in a convalescent center. And that was fantastic nursing experience, you know, for, for patient care. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, and I had sent you some answers and I had forgotten about that, but that was pretty impactful. Um, and I remember how I would, you know, comb someone's hair or put some rouge on them and some lipstick and make their day, like little mm-hmm. things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so that made a big difference. So anyway, that was a, a student experience. And then when I graduated, I, I went to a school in Pennsylvania at Elizabethtown for my first two years and then transferred to Widener University and got my BSN in, uh, so it was 78, yeah, 1978. And at Circumstances, I joined the military right after graduating, actually, that summer um, and was in the Navy for three years and then transferred to the Army on paper with the same rank uh, for another nine and a half. So almost 13 years in the military, mostly uh-huh. stateside. And I was also in Korea and they also sent me to graduate school to get my master's. So it was a very, very interesting, um, a variety of reinvention throughout that military career because we we changed uh, either jobs or geographic locations every few years. That's the way that's the way the system works. So I was able to travel and learn about East Coast and West Coast, never in the Midwest, but East Coast, West Coast and then Korea. Um, And so I um, I was in until about 1990 and then became a nurse entrepreneur right after getting out, after doing the Myers-Briggs and seeing that I was an apple in a basket of oranges. I didn't fit in the typical nurse, the typical military person. And I love teaching and motivating people. And my husband said, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I want to have my own business. What are you going to do? Well, (laughs) so I started Prosper Development Systems, this business in 1990, 91, where it stood for professional staff personal development. And uh, one of the junior colleges had me uh, teach some courses on professional development, and they became my courses and I started teaching. I did joint commission inspections. Um, but backing up to the military time, it's it was mostly in clinical med surge, intensive care, SICU, ER, orthopedic surgery, outpatient, uh, and then nursing education and staff development. So that helped me helping nurses with their careers, their professional development. Uh, so each job gave me more skills in nursing. Um, and when I got my master's, it was in adult as an adult nurse practitioner, clinical nurse specialist at Seton Hall back in my home state of New Jersey. And uh, I just, at that time, I was still in the military and they offered me a practitioner job pretty much anywhere because it was fairly new at the time. And I chose to be a chief nurse of a, a large uh, outpatient clinic and learn my admin that way instead. Um, and that kind of changed my directory from clinical to um consulting and research. Uh, I worked at Duke for a few years in research, 
uh, legal nurse consulting. So I've had a lot of reinventions in my career, some of it due to um, my spouse's executive relocations with his job and having to reinvent. And then previously in the military, having to reinvent and move geographically or, um, you know, just for skills to, to go to a different area in nursing. And I remember I was burnt out in my very first job in nursing in, in general medicine, ha- you know, being a 20 something year old handling a death and cancer and just different diagnoses um, for, of the sailors, some of them really young, some of them older. Um, it impacted me a lot. And a supervisor came up to me one day on evening shift and said, by the end of the day, I want you to tell me where you want to work and how much vacation you're taking and where you want to work when you come back from vacation. And I looked at her like, what? So I'd like nurses to know that they carry a lot in their hearts and sometimes you're not developmentally ready to handle the stress of dealing with people that are terminally ill or, you know, whatever their conditions might be. And I think of COVID and how it impacted nurses with handling so much death in their lifetime um, more and more during those years. Um, So I don't know, I feel like I have a mission to help nurses with their stress as well and get their words out either in poetry or journaling or, Mm -hmm. or, or whatever, something creative, creative arts. I hope that answers your question about my nursing. So I've done a lot of, you know, mostly adult, not peds, not OB, not psych. <laughs> so yeah. mostly adult. No, that's fascinating. I, I think that for nurses, uh, nursing is a career where you can do many, many different things. Definitely. And it's not just um, working at the bedside and seeing the same patients day in and day out. I mean, some people choose to do that. Absolutely. want to do, and that's great. But like, I had many, many hats in my nursing career. And now as I'm like, you know, in the le- end, at the end of it, um, doing college health, which is something that a lot of people might not even realize is an option, but I work on a college campus and I work with students teaching young people how to take care of themselves, basically, because they don't know how. They don't know how. Uh, one of my rotations as an adult nurse practitioner was working at university in the health center. So the same thing. And I saw some very interesting things mm-hmm. during clinical rotations there as well. Yeah. So power to you. Yeah, <laughs> mental health is a big piece now in that. And I also work closely with our local Alzheimer's Association, being, bringing programs to campus, not only for students, because students may be um, impacted with the loved one's dementia, parent, grandparent, whatever, but also faculty and staff that are all, also have these concerns for themselves or for others. So, it, you know, it, even though my clientele is very young, it doesn't mean that they're not concerned about dementia. Right. And also even for the curriculum to teach, uh, you know, a a course on dealing with dementia uh, would be fantastic in nursing school for the students just to learn about it. You know, I don't remember learning about that years ago. Definitely. I don't know if they cover it now. No, I know um, that if unless you're like working in labor and delivery and and postpartum, you're probably going to have somebody with dementia on your roster. Right. When you go to work, regardless of what unit you're in. Because I worked in med surge and I always did. And I worked in rehab and I worked in other areas where, you know, people who have dementia have accidents and get sick too. Exactly. And then dementia is not the reason they're there, but it's compounds everything else. Definitely. Going on with them and you really need skills and and it's, they don't, they didn't teach that. And some of the skills that they tried to teach us were very unrealistic. Like me getting a lesson with someone and how to do like, a one-to-one sit with a patient with dementia to keep them calm. But I had eight patients. <laughs> I was like, right, I can't sit here with right. this lady for an hour and hold her hand. I mean, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We always yeah. encourage families if their loved one is, is uh, hospitalized, that's when you need to be there. That's mm. not when you take a break mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. nobody's going to be watching them 24 um, seven. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you need to make oh. sure that things don't happen, med errors and accidents and stuff. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Let's talk about your poetry, because that seems to have been a big um, part of your life lately, and you do a lot with it. And it was inspired by your 
your grandmother and there was an you have an amazing story about that so why don't you tell us that story sure sure actually um it happened in 1991 the first spark um, i had gone to see the movie awakenings with my husband and my husband and i were kind of newly married it was just a few years that we were married so he didn't know my grandmother at all she had passed many years before that so we're at the movie theater watching awakenings and there was a character in the movie named lucy played by Alice Drummond, phenomenal actress, that caught a ball in her wheelchair. And she I guess she had like locked in syndrome. I forget what they called it in the movie. This was like 1991. But Robert De Niro and um, Robin Williams were in the movie. It's very, very good movie. So she she caught this ball and had a gaze about her. And this gaze brought back memories of when I was on my grandmother, uh, visiting my grandmother who was institutionalized with Alzheimer's. She had early Alzheimer's. And on her deathbed, the day before she passed, my parents and I went to see her and she did not recognize them. She was basically mute and more vegetative at the time. It was very, very end stage. But she reached out to me and mumbled and made a sound and connected with me. I'm 14 years old when this happened at her bedside. That movie brought that time back. So this is 1991 and it was 1971 when my grandmother passed and I was at her bedside. So 20 years after she passed, I'm crying in the movie theater. A few days later, and, and my, of course my husband's saying, why are you crying? You know, I'm like, I'll tell you later. So a few days later, he had gone on a business trip and this one night I could not get to sleep. I took a bath. I had a glass of wine. I was alone in, in, in our condo in Florida. And I said, you know, I'm going to grab this journal he gave me for Christmas previous year. And I sat on the couch, kept thinking about the movie and my grandmother. And this three-page poem poured out of me that rhymed, that was in sequence from childhood because I was eight to 14 going through this with grandma, who was my soulmate. And the poem ended 20 years after her death in 1991. It was called Anne's Zest Ends. I called my mom up the next day and read the poem to her. And she cried and said, that is the closest thing to what we went through back then. I want you to share this poem with everybody. And she was really, really, really emotional on the phone because she was in New Jersey. I was in Florida. So at the time, I was a nurse entrepreneur in Florida and um, a member of the Chamber of Commerce and uh, some nursing organizations. And so I would get up and ask, can I read this poem? And every time I read it, people would want to come up and talk with me about their aunt, their grandmother, their husband, their spouse, someone that had been affected by dementia. And people would be crying and I'm like getting tissues out and I'm like, whoa, what is this? What is this with this poem? So it impacted people, especially when I read it aloud. So I knew I had something. I I didn't know what it was, but I had something going on here with this poem. So I gradually kept writing and um, ultimately published my book in 93, Poetic Expressions in Nursing, Sharing the Caring. And I did a lot of um, continuing education programs with that. I was a member of Sigma Theta Tau um, as a distinguished lecturer and really was one of the nurse pioneers of nursing poetry because it, that poem started me writing. But I would write about, oh, gosh, I was a nurse administrator at the time and in, um, infection control, codes, day shift, night shift, having intuition, um, just things about nursing in my heart that I wanted to get out on paper. So uh, I republished the book, a second edition in 2021, because COVID had affected nurses so much and, you know, first responders and such that I just wanted to kind of give back and help nurses with poetry any way I could. Um, and so I've been, you know, working with different organizations and doing podcasts and just getting the word out. And I absolutely love it. I also teach haiku. Um, before COVID, I was teaching it at the the libraries, the county libraries, um, 
and had a blast. And I use, I'm also a nature photographer. So I use my nature photography as prompts for people to write their haiku poetry. And this is with the general public. So I want to use poetry for nurses as well. That's my goal for the next few years to try to, and I will be doing um, a, a workshop at UCSF in March. So we're starting something new with uh, nursing poetry. Uh, we have what, 4 million nurses at least? Some of them, are, some of them are leaving. Even even new nurses are leaving because of the stress that they mm-hmm. undergo. Uh, so I want to I want to make a difference with this nursing poetry, or just having them write, or do something creative to get their stories out. Yeah, you're you're onto something because poetry is a huge like release valve for people in stressful mm-hmm. situations, including caregivers. So that's we have a number Absolutely. of poetry books that are in all's authors and and poets as well. So. Um, just taking time to sit and even just journal or, or writing poetry can be a great way to release your stress and, and to help manage your emotions and, and kind of get things in order. Absolutely. And I, I like haiku because it's kind of succinct. It's fairly easy to do. It's five syllables, seven syllables, five, you know, three lines. Um, and it usually uses the seasons or, um, you know, uh-huh. weather, something in nature and your senses and you capture a feeling and when I was in, I was um, living in Sweden with my husband with one of his jobs in the 90s in like 94. And I presented the poetry to the nurses there. And I remember one of the Swedish nurses wrote about a haiku where there was a little boy that they couldn't save that choked on a peanut in a haiku. It was profound that you can capture a, a significant event like that, a horrendous event. And it's also therapeutic because that nurse was holding that in her heart all those years too, and got a chance to get it out on paper. So um, haiku is something that I just absolutely love teaching. I've been teaching it and I just want to explore. uh, And even with Alzheimer's support groups uh, to try to get involved with with my local group possibly and and, and do some caregiver uh, poetry Mm -hmm. therapy, not therapy, but I mean, just, you know, and and exercises to get them out because there's so many so many things inside the, the caregiver's heart as well. It's True. very emotionally challenging and you have to be able to take care of yourself as a caregiver first. Right. And this is a self-care activity. You know, we recommend at least you right. know, to find 15 minutes out of the day, schedule it in for yourself. And this could be what you decide to do. A lot of people right. like to write right. in the morning, like when they get up and it's quiet and maybe they're having a cup of tea or coffee mm-hmm. or whatever and just jot down their ideas and, and their thoughts then and put something together. Um, We have um, a book in our collection that a woman, woman found the little love poems that her father wrote her mother during their dementia. Oh, Um, it's called breakfast memories. So she used that, you know, as the foundation for her family's book about their dementia experience. So these things can come back Mm -hmm. later and have a lot of significant mm-hmm. value to not only the family, but to mm-hmm. general, the general public as well, because you can learn a lot. Exactly. Exactly. I remember writing po- a poem about caregivers. I have that in the book, um, a, a, a poem about someone in a nursing home, like, you know, instead of letting them just sit there to take them out for a walk in the sun, um, a, a poem about loss, grief. Um, so, Whatever it is, it's something that it'll inspire me and I will go and get pen on paper and write it out or or jot it down in my phone now, you know, now that we have phones. Um, I love nature. Nature would be very therapeutic for caregivers as well, just to get out for a walk, look at the sun shining, you know, or or even when it's winter. What what are your thoughts during winter? Write them down. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can you can also I don't know. Uh, maybe work with your your loved one with some poetry. Yeah. They might they might be able to rhyme. You never know what that part of the brain can be stimulated. Yeah, you read my mind because so. that would be a, an activity that you could do together. And in, in sometimes yeah. like handing somebody an object or something that they would be familiar with might stimulate them enough to come up with something and you could mm-hmm. help them articulate what they mm-hmm. wanted. They, they do that with art and with other things modalities Mm -hmm. um lego lego serious play is one and art doing all kinds of different art projects can help 
people with dementia who are considered unreachable or nonverbal to actually right. express right. something mm -hmm. and let you know that mm -hmm. that person is still there. I mean, they've lost their ability to communicate, to speak, uh, to participate. There's a lot of right. different things going on. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not there. Right. Or music, music you, yeah. you know, listening to music stimulates, getting up and maybe moving or sitting in the chair and dancing a yeah, little bit. One. Um, you know, so, um, yeah, yeah that's great. so many more things. Mm -hmm. So now you've gone yeah. through like your whole, you know, childhood, nursing career, uh, military career, started uh, your poetry and then your communications company. Tell us more about that. What do you do? Well, well, well before, before we get to the communications, I did become a mom. Oh, too, you did. Somewhere <laughs> in this mix. <laughs> yes, in 1998. So that changed my my you know, my direction a bit too. And I took a few years off and became a mom full-time. And then in uh, let's see, 2002, started doing some legal nurse consulting and a little bit wow. of that uh, while she was, yeah. And so, but she changed my life also. I'm trying to think what year this was. Uh, early 2000s, my daughter just gravitated to the arts and musical theater and theater. So uh, at 50, <laughs> I was cast as Mrs. Greer and Annie because she was going to be Molly and they needed adults. And they said, can you, I said, wait a minute, I don't even have a resume, an acting resume. So I got into acting. I did some in high school and, and in college, but my daughter is the stimulus for my new life here as a communicator because it started with acting. We, um, she would be in films or commercials or whatever, and I'd be on set with her and watch the process and just was mesmerized by it. So I started doing some acting in the early 2000s with her. And then we moved to Boston mm. and they were doing one after another film on location. And I, <laughs> oh, this is a great story though. Ricky Gervais was doing The Invention of mm -hmm. Lying in, I guess, 2008. And so I applied for it, you know, with the casting director and they called me and said, could you be in this casino scene? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to be away that weekend or whenever they were filming. And she said to me, you mean you're a nurse? You have that you're a nurse on your acting resume? And I said, yes. Are you available these three days? Blah, 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 blah. We have some scenes that they need a nurse. And yes. <laughs> Will I get my SAG card? Yes, because it was three continuous days. So that made me become a SAG AFTRA actor, that experience. And I was nurse three. I didn't have lines, but I was with the primary actors. And, and that changed my life as well, because I just loved being on film sets. And while we were in Boston from 2007 to 2010, there were a variety of films uh, done on location as well as TV shows. So that was a, another reinvention there for a few years. And then when we moved to San Diego in 2011, 2010, 11, my daughter was in a show called Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat for like the third time. And they usually have children and the adults in that show. And I had done a press release for the kids that were in the show here in, in San Diego. And the director said, you need to be on our board. We love that press release, blah, 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 blah. So that became another... I don't know, change in my life where I was on this board and I became the PR director for five wow. years and loved it. I absolutely loved it. There was something inside of me that's creative and entrepreneurial. Um, and so I did that until 2016. And then in 2016, I went freelance in PR, public relations, and I've worked with more theaters, filmmakers, lots of authors, um, artists, businesses, uh, filmmakers, I think I said that, and now recently some nurses that are in business to get the word out. So I am now, I've been doing that since 2011 with SJF Communications. Mm -hmm. So my life has gone from, you know, nursing and consulting and motherhood and acting, <laughs> acting and, and, and nature photography and, uh, and communications. And I, I'm still not done. <laughs> my mother, by the way, was a dance teacher. So I grew up those early years with dancing mm -hmm. school. Um, I wish I had done Girl Scouts. I'd never, mm -hmm. and I wish I had learned to play the piano, those mm -hmm. two things. 
but I did dance. So I have, I know, I know someday, Um, but I definitely have rhythm and that comes in handy with poetry, the cadence and the beat and that kind of thing. Um, I, I just love language and putting it all together and cadence and pace and things like that. Plus with the acting, I did, you know, like theater in high school and some college as well. So I'm kind of a complex individual <laughs> and I'm not no, done. You're like a Renaissance uh, not, woman. Not done. <laughs> and being part of Al's authors is so special because it, I'm just smiling like cheek to cheek now because it means so much to me that there's an organization that values people that, you know, care about people with dementia and that have, is it over 350 exactly. authors now? Yeah. I mean, that's absolutely amazing. Just such a good thing that you're doing um, and having this podcast, too, to get the word out because you never know who you'll reach. Right. Because dementia, it, it just affects everyone mm-hmm. in some way, you know? Yeah. That's so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, thank you for sharing all of that. That's really interesting. Um, I enjoy hearing your story. Thank you. And um, thanks for doing the poetry workshops. We're going to have to have maybe help help us do one of those what do you think yeah maybe we could do a haiku workshop on zoom yeah. or something and see how many people yeah i think we can could you we can definitely you do know, that. use that for some therapeutics yeah do that. so i'm going to ask you if you can read one of your poems i know we talked about a couple sure. of them and we're going to add the link to the poem Anne's zest ends which was the first poem that you wrote about your grandma you had mm-hmm. that like you know breakthrough during the movie yes but um, it's yes. kind of long so we're going to reserve that you know um for after the podcast people can click sure and see that hear that but uh, mm-hmm. i did rec- ask you to do a couple of others if you would like to do those that would be wonderful mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so did you say you said intuition is yeah one intuition which is um no I'm pe- i have yeah. it ready yeah, page 19 okay I can- okay and then i was thinking i was thinking of caregiver yes. too because yeah Would that work? Okay. Okay. So intuition. Please respect your intuition and acknowledge every hunch for you will find most certainly this preference is worth a bunch. It's that cozy yet dangerous gut feeling that appears every now and then. You cannot explain this phenomenon. You just know what will happen and when. It may be a look in a person's eye or a sense of impending doom predicting endless possibilities. It's the aura inside a room. Whatever this is, be wary and wise. Don't cast it aside and ignore it. If you're gifted with intuition, my friend, sit back, just relax, and adore it. (laughs) (laughs) And I really, truly trust my intuition Mm -hmm. for many, many years. And uh, it's that gut feeling. Yeah, nurses develop that. If they aren't born with it, you develop it. And it's kind of... Like Absolutely. that, all of your experiences mm-hmm. that kind of like live deep down inside that you in your subconscious that pop up and say, wait a minute, there's mm-hmm. something here. I've seen this before, mm-hmm. or I know, I know what this is. And I think it's important for caregivers to trust their intuition and, and Absolutely. To, you Absolutely. know, what, what they know about their loved one. That's very mm-hmm. important. Okay. So then you were going to read the one about caregivers. Caregiver. So I wrote caregiver, um, Back in the 90s, when it was caregiver day at a memory disorder uh, facility Mm -hmm. in Largo, Florida. So it's called caregiver. So I wrote caregiver in the 1990s, early 90s, um, at a caregiver day for a a long-term care facility that that dealt with uh, caregivers for memory patients. Caregiver. I, your loving caregiver need my own care as well, so I can be your guiding strength, hearing stories you may tell, and follow when you wander, and take the lead at times, answering your many questions, listening to your words and rhymes. I, your loving caregiver, need time alone for me, to relieve my stress from worry, so your support I can be. Whether I should write a poem, or take a bubble bath, or go and see a movie, or walk along some path, or call a friend and chat a while, or a big hug receive, or scream and yell from frustration. This time I really need. Please don't misunderstand me. 
I wear my ribbon with pride. You know you're very special to me, and my love for you I'll not hide. Just one more thought I'll ponder, a wish I will convey. Through the trials and tribulations, don't fear. I remain your caregiver today. Mm. Because caregivers need, they just need support. Too. Yes. They need a hug. And this poem is a hug mm -hmm. for all caregivers because I, I, I wish that we had the resources that we have today for caregivers too. But still, even with all the support, it's very stressful and frustrating mm -hmm. sometimes. So um, that it's my little ode to you as a caregiver. Thank you so much. I think people mm -hmm. will appreciate that. So this book, um, it's it's a nice little book. It's not too, um, it's not a huge thing. So that's makes it something mm -hmm. that you can put in your pocketbook and bring to work with you if you're a nurse and you want to take some time on your lunch break or whatever to maybe sit and, and read something to encourage you because a lot of the poems offer encouragement and inspiration. Some of them are about issues that nurses encounter routinely and it won't sound, be anything new. And then some of them are about actual people that you've experienced. Right. Family members. Uh, I know when my, when my dad had heart surgery mm -hmm. back in the early nineties, I, uh, I wrote while he was in the uh, OR and then I was able to explain things to my mom, like what tubes he would have and this and how it's going to look. And, you know, uh, when my grand, my other grandmother turned 80, I did a poem for her. Uh, when a friend from grammar school's sister passed away from melanoma, I wrote a poem about mm -hmm. her. So there's a there's a variety of types. And then there's thoughts and conflicts that I've had. I, I write about when I'm inspired by different things. Um, the book is not just for nurses. It's for any human that cares about wanting to know more about nurses also, mm -hmm. uh, first responders, or it's a gift that a person can give to a nurse in their family or or a friend. Or at their favorite at their uh, facility, the nurse at their favorite facility. Instead facility. of buying a box of donuts Absolutely. or chocolates, you could get right. the book. Right. You know? We have this in one of the uh, one of the hospital's uh, gift shops mm -hmm. stocks them. We had them there for the holidays. Uh so and I'm definitely open to, you know, speaking to groups and doing workshops. Zoom. Um, I'm in the San Diego area. So if there's people in Southern California, um, yeah. you know, I, I'd like to do that. I, I did a lot of public speaking way back in the mostly in the 90s. And, and I just love getting up and, and, you know, making an impact and motivating others and inspiring others. But I think the key thing is to get your stories out. Don't keep them bottled inside. Find some kind of a creative art um, and know how important caregivers are definitely and the fact that we have al's al's authors to help us and the community the community is very very important for support um join groups support groups um you know talk to a friend take take time for yourself because um, caregivers are so important mm -hmm. and so needed and and life is stressful to begin with let alone with covid and with what's happening in the world, you know, so we all need support and I'm here for you. Thank you. Now, where can people find your book? Probably anywhere by now. I mean, if you go to my website, sjfcommunications.com, there's an author page. Um, it's on Amazon. It's uh, it's in paperback, ebook and audiobook, all okay. three. Um, yeah. So, uh, and it's in the all's authors bookstore. Absolutely. On our website, yes. all the books are categorized yes. for you. You'll find it under poetry selections. So, yeah, yeah, so that's yeah. a great way to pick it up. And we, our website links to Amazon, so that's where you would, that's where you would be led to buy the book. Absolutely, yeah. and we get yeah. a little kickback because yeah. we're an associate. So, right, if you buy right. a book through our link, then we're going to get a, a little bit of money, a few cents probably, but um, every little bit helps. Perfect. We're always. Absolutely, for, uh, absolutely. Funds to keep going because then the bigger we get, the more expensive this becomes. Right. And if you do have the book purchased, um, please leave a review on Amazon or um, on my website or 
uh, on Goodreads, things oh, like yeah. that, because reviews are very, very yes, important. Are. And because my book is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a certain niche that it's for nursing and, and stuff. It's not a very, very popular book out there. Um, but I just want to make an impact any way I can, whether I speak to groups, um, teach haiku, or come on po- podcasts mm-hmm. like this, you know, to share Share the caring. Yes. <laughs> Poetic expressions in nursing, sharing the caring. Sharing the caring. And um, where can people find you on social media? SJFcommunications.com. So that's S for Susan, J for Joy, my middle name, and Faris, F, SJF Communications, and that's plural. Dot com. Okay. And what about Facebook, Twitter, any of that? Yes, I'm on Facebook at my name as well as SJF Communications. And I'm on Twitter, um, TikTok, Instagram as at S-J-F-C-O-M-M-O, commo, S-J-F commo. Um, and in my Instagram link, there's a uh, link tree. So it has a lot of my links. Great. Yeah. So I'm all over the place. Yeah, well, you should <laughs> be. It's a professional like, <laughs> PR person. I hope right. you're Communication. using your own right. skills for right. yourself. Yep. That'd be great. So thank you so much, Susan. It was wonderful having you here today. Appreciate you giving us your time. Oh, Marianne, it's such a pleasure. You are an amazing, amazing person. And thank you for all that you do and Al's Al's Authors does. I'm so proud to be part of it. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, you too. Thank you for listening to Untangling Alzheimer's and Dementia, an Alz Authors podcast. For more details on this episode, please see the show notes. If you enjoyed the podcast, please leave a review and subscribe to it on whichever platform you use to listen to your favorite podcasts. For more information on Alz Authors, please visit allsauthors.com. While you're there, be sure to browse our online bookstore, where you will find hundreds of carefully vetted books on Alzheimer's and dementia. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Please email your thoughts on the podcast to allsauthors at gmail.com. We are a 501c3 charitable organization, totally reliant on donations to do what we do. If our author's stories move you, please consider contributing to our cause. Remember, you are not alone. One can sing a lonely song, but we chose to form a choir and create harmony. Hi, I'm Anne of All's Authors. When I was caring for my mother with dementia, I searched long and hard for memoirs and personal stories about other caregivers' experiences. I wanted to know not just how other people survived, but how they thrived. Unfortunately, at the time, there was not much available. That's why we created the bookstore at allsauthors.com. Now, busy caregivers can easily browse for just the right resource to guide them on their journey. Books are categorized by relationship and type of dementia, as well as genre. You'll find a helpful title in just minutes using our search tool. So, after the podcast, take a few moments to visit our bookstore at allsauthors.com bookstore. Remember, you are not alone.